Uh, good morning, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for joining us. We'll get started. Uh, we'll, I'm sure have a few latecomers, but uh, we'll at least get started. And uh, this will be recorded so people can watch it later on if they weren't able to make it or if you want to review any of the content that we go to. But I'd like to welcome you to Opening the Floodgates Without Drowning, uh, Health First's journey with Split. I'm Dave Murphy. I'll be your uh, host today for the, the webinar. And um, we do have uh, a Zoom going on, as you can tell. So you, there's lots of ways that you can react to what we do or what we talk about in this Zoom presentation. So feel free to raise your hands or react with many of the Zoom reacting uh, icons. Uh, also, uh, we have uh, chat. So we would really like to have you put your questions in chat and we'll answer any questions that we can. And basically just ask you, to sit back and uh, enjoy and hopefully uh, learn something from uh, the experiences uh, from our friends at, at Health First. Uh, today, uh, joining me also is Dan O'Connell. He's a member of Split's customer success team uh, with a focus on helping his customers achieve business results for the last 10 years. We're excited to have Dan with us at Split. Many of our strategic partners are making sure they get value from their investment in Split by working with Dan. Dan will be manning the chat, and so he'll be able to uh, answer uh, questions directly in chat or maybe bring them up through the, um, through the, the presentation here. Um, our special guest today is, is Julian from Health First. With 12 years plus focused on mobile applications, he joined Health First almost four years ago as part of a broader digital transformation initiative. At the time when the pandemic broke loose, New York City was, as many of you know, at the epicenter. The customer digital experience team was challenged to shift and accelerate delivery to help the communities that health first services. Face-to-face -face interactions were simply not an option. The solution, digital access to rapidly evolving information, food and nutrition, shelter, telemedicine, enablement, and more. And Julian was right in the middle of all of that. His favorite phrase, Plans are useless, but planning is essential from Eisenhower. With that, I am going to stop sharing my screen and turn it over to Dan, or to Julian, excuse me. Well, hey, good morning and good afternoon, everyone joining. Um, Dave and Dan, thanks for having me. I'm going to try to bring up my slides here real quick. Let me know if that's all good. Yep. All right. All good. Okay. So, I um, wanted to share a few um, um, use cases of, um, uh, of us and Split. Uh, but before that, I'll, I'm going to go with a brief intro of Health First. Um, we're the largest not for profit health insurer in uh, New York with about 1.8 million members and almost uh, 30 years plus in business. Uh, we're pioneers in the value based healthcare model, uh, which is a model where hospitals and physicians are paid based on patient outcomes. And to the right, you can see a little bit of our community involvement and how you're uh, part of the five boroughs here in New York City and beyond. Um, so first use case that I wanted to share today is uh, our customer uh, chat. And that is uh, an experience that we brought up uh, both between uh, mobile web and for our internal agents. Um, so a little bit of what the chat experience looks like within our app. I'm sure many of you have already used a uh, chat service uh, with the digital services that you engage. This one is no different. Um, there's a way to uh, see what the chat agent hours are and to just interact through the mobile app, iOS and Android, similar experience on the web. Uh, and then to the right, you can see a little bit of what the agent's able to use to respond to those messages. Um, the reason why I chose this uh, case is because it, it's not just digital. There's actual humans that have to sit on the other end of the line and respond to the messages. Um, so it's a different challenge in terms of coordinating the rollout and expansion of our chat usage across these platforms. So thankfully, we were able to do some of that um, by leveraging Split. Um, and some of the uses that we um, did with Split was to be able to turn it on for a specific group of members. Um, and that is that bottom part where you see segment chat. 
Um, so the segment is a group of users. We selected uh, previously a group of members uh, that we were engaging with us through other channels and that we knew uh, would, would uh, interact with our chat agents first. Uh, we are able to also filter by app version, which is what you see there as well. So if let's say the chat feature is available through a certain version of the mobile app or website, uh, then we're able to, uh, to filter by that. Um, and then uh, last but not least, um, during our uh, extended chat rollout, and this we're talking about uh, more than a year worth of journey, uh, we were using different chat services providers. Um, and so we were able to leverage split to seamlessly switch between one provider or another um, provider without uh, neither members nor uh, CCO agents noticing. Um, so it's just basically the pipe through which the, the chat messages go through. Uh, and being able to switch through that. Uh, so this is my first use case. Um, Dave, I don't know if you want me to pause here or should I go through both and questions later? Uh, let, let's go through both and then we can circle back and, and kind of cover them all in, in a group. Thanks. Sounds good. All right. So the second one, uh, premium payments, um, and this spans uh, across feature one-time payments and uh, regulatory changes, which are a different type of problem. Um, so with feature one-time payment, uh, we already had a payments um, solution available both in web and mobile, uh, but we wanted to bring um, this further. Uh, our demographic uh, is usually a low-income population and uh, 65 plus. Uh, so we did want to make sure we had an option for members that perhaps are not as financially stable. Um, to set up the auto pay feature and kind of forget about it. And they might have to set up a payment, but you know they had the ability to do it kind of on the spot, like right then and there, or as a recurrent payment, but not the ability to do a feature one-time payment. So that is a one-time one payment uh, for a fixed amount that only happens one time. Um, and then allowing that to happen at a feature date. So let's say next week, uh, premium payments do, how do I turn that on uh, or set up a payment so I don't have to come back on that date or forget and then fall out of coverage. This is not just about collate, collecting the premium. There's uh, For certain plans, there's also a coverage uh, aspect with it. So if you forget, then you lose coverage and then you might find the next time you're visiting a doctor, that's not something we want for our members. So another case with payments, um, and that happened last year, uh, there's a regulatory change with um, having a certain plan stop having a premium payment responsibility. So that means past a certain date, there's no more uh, monthly premium uh, due. So this was a re regulatory change, and uh, there's there's a bill or law associated with it, and we don't necessarily know when it's going to starting to affect, and uh, the legal system does not uh, use Agile. So with that, uh, we were kind of in a bit of a pickle and we, what we ended up doing was um, build out the feature and enable it through split past a certain date. I'm gonna show a bit of that configuration for both use cases here. Um, so again, enabling by platform, uh, the plan uh, rollout, which is what you see at the top where we uh, list out certain plans by name that we wanted to um, extend the feature one-time payment feature with. Uh, and then at the bottom, you can see for uh, for the no uh, premium due, a date after which it comes into effect. Uh, and one of the things that was useful about it is that if let's say the, the the regulatory change wouldn't have come into effect or would have been delayed, then we just flip the switch back off and we continue to collect the premium dues. Um, so that was uh, the second case here. And then, a little bit about our journey ahead with uh, split and uh, feature flagging as a whole. Um, so A-B experimentation, um, this is the ability, I mean, the, the clearest example to me is for retail, right? Like you move this button or you make it bigger and so your sales increase. For us, that's not as immediately obvious because, well, we're not selling directly to consumers, right? It's just usage of our services that we enable to, um, allow better healthcare outcomes. So 
understanding how to design experiments with that context in mind where it's not as immediately obvious. Um, I think we need to develop that further. Automatic rollbacks, that's a little bit more on the tech side. So being able to, if uh, let's say a certain feature starts uh, not performing well, and this is on the technical side, like uh, scale issues or API issues as a whole, um, how do we automatically interact with our uh, split and disable that certain feature so that it's not visible to members? And then the last one is what I refer to as successful failures. So a successful failure is, well, a failure, but that, that you're able to use to learn something from. A very famous industry successful failures for me uh, would be the Google Glass and the Fire Phone, right? Um, so we all probably remember or not remember them, but I'm sure that the teams involved learn uh, a lot through them. So as part of our, uh, our growth uh, journey, how do we design these experiments and get more comfortable with having failed and learning from what uh, from what that meant from our product and our services? That's all I had in terms of use cases, Dave. Thanks a lot. I, and on that last point, I one of my favorite um, quotes I heard from one of our customers is talking about doing measurement and experimenting is that you win some and you learn some, which is to say that, you know, we have a successful failure and that's okay because you might learn something from that. I, I love the phrase, uh, the legal system uh, does not use agile. I think <laughs> I'm not sure if that's yours, but I, I think that's awesome. Um, maybe expand a little bit about how you um, you engage with that. So is it that you are releasing your apps to like the various app stores? Because I know that's going to be a whole process in itself and you're releasing them in such a way that you can then turn things on and off based on whether or not through a HIPAA compliance or a legal system or whatever that there uh, should be available to customers. Certainly, yes. So with... Um... With the mobile app ecosystem, it's a little bit different with web, um, just because uh, when you upload a new version of a website, that is the version everyone gets. Uh, however, with the mobile app, everyone kind of grabs a copy of your production at a certain point in time. Um, so the first thing that we're, we were able to leverage uh, Split for was to dissociate the, the act of uploading the app to the store and getting the adoption uh, which means people, you know, get the update usually at night with the phone charging and whatnot. Um, if they have that setting on, then they will get the latest update. Um, and past a future date, past we see that adoption, we are able to turn on and off uh, new uh, new features. Um, so that was the first use case there. Yeah. So I am really intrigued by the fact that your customer base. Um, is targeted at low income and, and uh, 65 plus and just kind of understanding the dynamics of at least the the, the older generation they're not going to be updating their apps all the time right they kind of they might be on some very old versions of it how, how do you deal with that we we have um generally within a week we get about 80 percent of adoption through our latest app version uh, part of it is uh, because over time, people learn to have the automatic update set up on their phone. And uh, the other part is we also leverage Split to um, uh, put up a pop-up uh, for them to be aware that, um, that there is a new version available. Uh, so usually we, we try to support just the top three um, latest versions. And past that, you might get a message that says you need to uh, update your app. Okay. And you know, a lot of your interaction with your um, customers uh, are through the app, obviously, or the website. You did have at the beginning, your first slide, you had the tent and, you know, the people joining. I know that one of the differentiators that you guys perceive is in, in terms of how you differentiate differentiate yourself is is the community touch and, and that. And, and do you do anything in particular to, through your applications to kind of enhance that, um, that sort of community feel? Yes, we actually had earlier this year a, a, a fair uh, where there was live entertainment and uh, health first uh, reps available to interact with uh, existing and new members uh, and just to 
do something is, you know, like help them get their account set up, anything like that with the group that might uh, be a little bit more challenged with technology, we have that that uh, friendly touch. Uh, what we do for that behind the scenes is being actively monitoring what are the pain points. So like if a registration is becoming difficult, uh, we earlier rolled out a, a, the ability to automatically fill up the registration form by taking a picture of your ID card. And that's just another example of how we can uh, turn those those uh, friction points into actions to to uh, enhance the digital experience. Cool. So getting maybe a little bit back to the technical side, how would you characterize your your release process today and and has it changed by using split and feature flags? Certainly, yeah, our, our overall release process has evolved a lot um, through my time here. Um, I think towards the beginning, it was a little bit more traditional and now it's very dynamic. Um, the reason for that uh, is uh, just the overall team maturity. That was one component and being able to plan out what are the dependencies and coordinate the deployments so that so that the whole thing becomes available as a single experience. Uh, that was one part. And then just being able to dissociate um, the, the turning on of the feature with the deployment um, through Split was, was certainly helpful, uh, especially for customer facing uh, applications. Uh, there are things where we can't do that as easy if let's say we have a database you can't you know feature flag that perhaps that 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 uh, that easily but most of the customer facing applications uh, we're able to to do those things now okay and um you mentioned at the end kind of a peek ahead at some of the things you're thinking about doing um how, how would you bucket the the your current use of flags i noticed that you were using some targeting specifically which is the ability to just pick which users get to see which things. And I know you also do some uh, things where you're just turning features on and off for everybody. Um, how would you kind of characterize the other, any other use cases that you might have for flags? Certainly. So, so we set up our flags across uh, channels, as you were seeing. So the same experience across web, iOS, Android, and any other channels that might be involved are always set up um, through the same flag and that way we can coordinate across our uh, various teams uh, when a certain feature is gonna appear and if it's gonna appear through all the channels. Um, that's one part of it. And then in, in terms of our, our internal user split, I would categorize them in three buckets. Um, the first one is the what I refer to as the developer bucket, uh, which is this part of work is not done, but I want the release train to continue to go out. So uh, let me disable this section until the work is completed. Um, the second bucket is uh, the one we made more reference to, uh, and that is um, having the feature flag or the feature complete and turn it on uh, past a certain point in time, right? So this dissociate through the uh, up upload or deployment of your application and being able to turn it on at a later point in point. Um, the, the last one is the one, uh, the A-B testing one, which is, uh, well, I have two flows, so in one, uh, we put this this button up here, and then the other one is going to be towards the bottom, and we're going to see uh, what performs better with our users. That one is the one that we're still evolving and using more of. Um, it's a little bit more complex, like I was mentioning, based off the use case and, and having or designing ways to measure uh, when you're not just converting directly to, to dollars like most retail companies do. Yeah, that's interesting because I, you know, we we at Split talk a lot about measurement uh, overall, and, and not just necessarily being associated with did something convert or did the person press the blue button versus the red button more times, those sorts of things. Do you have a sense of the kinds of things that you might measure, and do you have anything in particular in mind as th that you're looking to as your first areas to experiment? Yeah, so the, the first example that came to mind was related to the future one-time payment, but then again, that, that is dollars, uh, right? So like seeing if uh, someone was able to set up the future one-time payment versus um, doing uh, the payment on the spot, um, but also looking downstream and seeing, well, are we getting less people from this plan falling out of coverage because now we enabled them to set up the payment in this, in this new way? Um, Beyond that, um, we offer a lot of uh, community resources, so the ability to find uh, places to get food, um, shelter, and other resources. And so we do look at how is that 
uh, use based on where it is placed in the in the mobile app. So expanding a little bit of that um, and understanding how as the app grows and there's uh, more services and resources that we uh, that we make available, how do we rank them in a way that people still know where to find things and and uh, use them as they were using them in previous versions? Okay, I, I imagine that many of the folks on the line are you know thinking about how they might implement um, flags and do something similar to what what you're doing. What what kind of barriers did you face? What was their you know immediate acceptance, or did you have to kind of drive uh, acceptance of using flags, or what? How did that work in your organization? And and then what did you do to you know, really make sure that everyone felt comfortable with um, what sometimes can be perceived as extra work to put in a flag versus the benefit? Certainly. Um, we're a very dynamic company, but it's also a large organization. So I would say uh, just the ability of sharing what we're doing with other teams uh, was something that took uh, a while. Um, with that, we would have internal meetings where we were demoing what we did with the feature and how it would work, and then setting up accesses across our um, our QA and product teams uh, the right way so that our different environments are guarded in the same way that they were always um, guarded. And then uh, with our uh, release management process, just tying that to our uh, ServiceNow changes and other activities uh, so that we have a, an audit log of what happened and what. Are you using splits approval flows? I, you know, for those who don't know, we're coming out with a connection to service now soon. So I'm not sure if you're planning to use that as well. Yeah. Yeah, we've been uh, working on setting that up. Uh, we do use the split approval flows, uh, which are very similar to GitHub pull request approver uh, set up. And so we just say, okay, this is what I want to change. And this is who I want to take a look and approve it. And then that triggers an email to that other group and they have a, a look and see. And just, you know, having another set of eyes is always helpful um, because you might be working on it very closely and you might forget, I don't know, to add one plan to the list or something else. And so that that goes through environments as well. In our non-production environment, we set up the all of our feature flags the way we want it the day we go to production. And so we just copy over to the production environment. Okay. I, I want to go circle back again on, on just your business because it is pretty fascinating that that this is, you know, the times that we're in, obviously, we talked about the pandemic up at the top and telemedicine. And you know, do, do you see, I'm, I'm assuming that your services and the way you've evolved and you've delivered have um, been in reaction to a lot of the things going on in the world. Do you see things returning back to the way you did it before or have we pretty much... Uh, past the point of no return and, and, and the world has changed in terms of in terms of your business and how you deliver services to your customers. Certainly, yes. Yeah. So, so we see um, what we see is in line of what the industry at large sees, and that is uh, there was a, a, a change in trends on how people interact with digital services, uh, especially with telemedicine. Uh, there was simply no other option. So that's a, a powerful adoption driver. Um, past that point, certain things that re return to in-person um, as they were before. Um, so the, the usage uh, probably went a little bit down on that end, but the, the overall trend definitely is higher than what it was before. Okay. Um, back on the technical and the acceptance side, do you have um, best practices that you've established for use of flags? Do, have you created a, a wrapper for the flag or what do you... What do you do to drive consistency in the organization in terms of the way people um, use use feature flags and, and eventually use measurement? Yeah, so on the client side, um, we have our wrapper around the various uh, split as the case. Um, so that is our way to um, our way to look use split, I think that's that's the best way to put it. Um, so let's say we want all our flags to start with off by default and then switch to on. That's the place where we're able to do some of those things. And then from the split admin console, we have, um, as I was mentioning earlier, some of the groups set up. So like matching our, um, our dev environments to follow our software development lifecycle and then the user access groups so that we enable our QA team to make changes on a certain environment and developers not to be able to 
alter uh, the state of the environment without uh, QA knowing because that's where they're doing their work and so on. Has QA changed? I, I've always been um, very fascinated by the the impact that that using um, flags can have on a, a QA team. And you know, we've seen people actually get rid of environments because they start doing more of the QA process in production by limiting who gets to see what and those sorts of things. Has has QA changed yet in terms of how you guys do it? Yeah, I've noticed a big change from when we first started till um, nowadays, um, just getting the comfort of how the system operates and the ability to control it and knowing that it does what it's meant to do. I think that is part of the journey of adopting a feature flagging platform. Um, and once that's done, uh, being able to again associate the upload of the of the version with the turning on a feature part of it uh, we do still have environments i don't see us removing uh, environments as a result of this uh, we like to have a place where we set up and stage everything and then being able to copy it over um, to production but even within production we do have features that are available perhaps just to us through a test mode um, and then we enable it to a broader group Okay. Uh, has anything, <clears throat> excuse me, has anything surprised you as you've gone through this journey of, um, you know, releasing software previously without flags to, to now using uh, a system where you're gating features? And is there anything that was surprising or was it everything that you expected? So from a technical point of view, I think it met my expectations and, and, and then some more. Um, but, you know, in terms of the nature of the mobile ecosystem, uh, I couldn't imagine doing it without a feature flagging system just because, um, you know, I've been doing mobile for a while. And uh, in the earlier days, uh, if you had an issue in production, it would take a week just because of the nature of the Apple approval process and whatnot. Um, and then people downloading the latest copy of the app. Uh, with web technologies, it it's a little bit more fluid. It's easier to see what, uh, what the environment is going to be and what you're changing and it's more product oriented than tech oriented uh, with mobile. I think it, it's a bit of both. Yeah, I can imagine how with mobile, um, we talked a little bit about this earlier, having the, the challenges that you face there with um, the app stores and getting things approved and, and those sorts of things. Um, in, in doing so, um, is, is part of your release process tied to the fact that you are a healthcare company that you do have specific requirements around, uh, you know, legal HIPAA, whatever else that that might um, uh, affect how you release software. Yeah, certainly we have our several stages in our uh, lifecycle process. Um, we have our security audit uh, for everything that we upload, making sure that everything is uh, HIPAA compliant, and that starts from the very beginning of the process of uh, creating a new feature just the, the way we architect, design, what is being transmitted, what it isn't. We're very careful about that. Um, and then as we promote uh, through the environments, uh, there are certain places where perhaps we can't leverage uh, uh, feature flags uh, and others where it makes more sense. Uh, and I'm talking about those that are that have UI associated to it primarily, right? Like, so like, like there's a security update it needs to happen this week there's no way around it, right? You can't really feature flag that, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, for teams, you know, again, thinking about some of the folks on, on the line that are just thinking about getting started with um, with flags or maybe doing some things that they hadn't done before, do you have any particular advice on, you know, how, on how to get going and, and how to approach it? Well, I think they have to talk to Dan, right, for that? <laughs> Um, but but yeah, I mean, in terms of our experience, uh, it um, just getting started somewhere, like choosing a very low hanging, low hanging and direct uh, target um, is is a good way to start. And for us, at least, it started with one application, one certain feature, and then it it started to grow from there. Um, so I wouldn't hold adoption by thinking you have to do it for everything and what does that mean for all the several applications you know start somewhere it's always a good a good thing i couldn't agree more i mean we find that often cases you know we have a nice 
onboarding system that gets people going and started and training and all those sorts of things and nice learning management system that people can do and uh, hopefully our documentation is good. We, we, you know, we've tried to make it easy to start, but fundamentally, I think what we found is, you know, pick something that has impact, that has value, start there, make it successful, and then it just tends to grow. That kind of your experience as well? Yeah, certainly. So, um, Actually, sorry, if I could, I've got one question that came in and it's appropriate to uh, what you just outlined. And uh, so it's taking the release process. You'd mentioned, uh, Julian, that you've gone from traditional to dynamic. And uh, uh, what does dynamic mean? So you, you, I love the idea of picking uh, one component and starting there. But what has that journey been like in terms of your uh, historical release process? And where are you now? And do you see yourself at the end of the journey? Or do you want to become even more dynamic when we understand what that time frame is? Yeah, there's certainly a road ahead. Um, I think towards the beginning, our release cycle would be uh, one and a half months, depending on which application. Um, and now um, some applications are matching our three-week uh, release cadence, um, so they, it aligns with our uh, sprint. Uh, going beyond that, I think it, it very much depends on the nature of the application. Like we were saying earlier, if it's a database, then perhaps you can't really you know, do much around it in terms of experimentation. Uh, if it's a, a mobile app, it also doesn't make sense to do um, what, what uh, the continuous delivery, like meaning like a feature is finished and uploaded because people will get updates every day uh, with web. That makes more sense. So I think it's very technology dependent in, in summary. Super. And uh, one more while we're on the, uh, the topic. Uh, this is more about kind of the, uh, the adopt, adoption acceptance, but uh, can you share if and how uh, uh, feature flaggings changed how you uh, collaborate or work with other teams. So you, you've got uh, product, QA, uh, uh, engineering team, marketing. Uh, has it affected that landscape at all? Absolutely, both within our internal teams. So like our product and QA team, but also when we have um, dependencies that are across several teams, like we were talking earlier with the chat example, uh, we're able to say, yeah, Upload when you're ready. It doesn't. We don't have to do it all day and sit through a call all day until we turn the whole thing on. Uh, everyone can do it on their own time, and then we can regroup and enable the feature uh, when everyone is ready from from their back end side. Excellent. Oh, thank you. I'll kick back to you, Dave. Thanks, Dan. I, I'm going to um, actually close here with a question that uh, this is being recorded. So you have your opportunity now, uh, Julian, to uh, to tell us what would you like to see Split do? What would be your top request for a, a new feature or, or, or capability? Ooh, okay. So I would love to see the ability to copy a whole environment into another one uh, through the UI. Uh, right now, we have to do it um, base of uh, each feature, especially when they have complex uh, settings like the ones that we were talking about. We would like to be able to set up all of our non-prod environment in the way we want it to their production, copy all over to production, uh, and then from there switch any other thing that we might need later in that in that release cycle. Awesome. So <clears throat> excuse me, that will go to our PM folks directly. Um, but one question on that, are you, do you typically, and I, I'm always curious as to how customers view moving software through their various environments, do you typically take the, the rules that you set in lower environments and kind of promote them along with the uh, rest of the software, the rules themselves as to who gets to see what? Yes, the initial state of what we want the next version to be, we uh, replicate across. We have four environments, so we start setting it up and then promoting it as we go by. And past the uh, the moment the new version is uploaded, there are certain rules that are version specific, like we were seeing there uh, earlier. But uh, once we uh, set up the initial state, then we might need to change later that. But the, the the first state is the one that we do our most of our testing with. Got it. Okay, great. Well, thank you for the feedback and appreciate the, the, the question um, or the, the request. 
uh, and appreciate your, your time today. I think, uh, again, this is a particularly interesting area for all of us, given the, you know, what's going on in the world. And so the, the way that you've lived through it in New York City, no less, has been uh, really eye-opening and, and interesting to hear about. So thank you again for your time. Thank you to everyone on the call for, for joining us today. We appreciate you, uh, you coming, and we will be making this available as a recording. Uh, Dan, thank you for helping out. And we'll uh, we'll end with that. So have yourselves a, a great rest of your day. Fine. Right, thanks for having me.